Alternate. In this video, we'll be discussing Jakarta's public transportation history and more. I first have to thank Jay Foreman's excellent series on London city planning, which inspired me to make this video. And Andriansha Yasin Sulaiman from Chester Jakarta for helping me review the script. With all that said, let's get on with it. Jakarta is enormous. Being almost the size of entire Singapore, while hosting almost twice the amount of people, at over 10 million, if Jakarta didn't have public transportation at all, it would be congested to death. Before I continue, I need to clear up some confusion regarding some terms. Jakarta is a special capital region, equivalent to a province, meaning it's technically not one city, it's more like a city of cities. It's divided into five smaller cities and one, other frequently forgotten about, Regency. For convenience, I'll be referring to the area comprising the special capital region as simply Jakarta. The Jakarta metropolitan area is another rather confusing name. Sources like Wikipedia also use the term Greater Jakarta to refer to the metropolitan area, which I'll be doing mostly. It officially contains Jakarta as well as five satellite cities and three regencies. I'll also be referring to the metropolitan area as Jabodetabek since that's the local name used in Indonesia. Before the tram, there was one way to get around Jakarta, horses. Dog carts, known locally as the Delman, from his character Charles Theodore Delman, was the way to get around the Jakarta the fastest at the time. While great as the recreation of transport, in fact, you can still find Delmans here in Jakarta and several other Indonesian cities, I can't imagine how it must have been for people who depended on these things for transport. Just probably not a lot. Most people back then still walked or maybe even cycled. Until the Dutch company, Batavia Shea Tramweg Maatschappij or BTM introduced the first trams on the 20th of April 1869. The trams were game changing. They allowed for many people to ride on the same vehicle. Due to colonialism, people were segregated and the common native Indonesians were relegated to the rather terrible open buses. At first, the trams used horses, but this was impractical and inefficient, and the horses were dying of exhaustion from pulling their trams around all day. So in 1882, they closed all the horse trams and transitioned to steam power, completing their tradition in 1884. Later, in April 1899, another company, Batavia Elektrische Tram Maatschappij, or BETM, opened a new tram rail, this time for electricity. The electrified trams were a success. There was no longer any more steam pumped up from the locomotive, and the air was cleaner. This made the low competition between the two companies fierce and the third ugly. Eventually, the two companies merged, forming the Batavia Verkeersmaatschappij, or BVM. After the Japanese invaded Indonesia in World War II, the Japanese military took the trams and then managed them under the Jakarta Shiden company. Under it, the class system that segregated Indonesians was abolished, and the Dutchies working in the trams were fired with Japanese decoration being plastered on the trams. After the proclamation of independence, Jakarta Shiden was nationalized under the PPD or Pengangkutan Penumpang Jakarta and renamed to Tram Jakarta Kota. Trams remain the default way Jakartans got around the city. However, Sukarno, our first president, didn't feel like trams would fit in Jakarta. He instead advocated for a metro or underground railway to be built, which never happened until very recently. The city and radio provisional government begged Sukarno to allow them to keep the trams. However, Sukarno had made up his mind, citing that the trams were in bad shape and would cost a lot to renovate. After trams were removed, you can see remnants of them in some places in Jakarta, most notably outside of the Fatulai Museum. Ironically, the Delman, despite being older and more convenient to ride on, managed to survive longer than their tram, a bit more as, as a recreational vehicle than a practical one. That's not to say people nowadays only use these traditional methods of transport, like the Delman, for recreational purposes. Some people still use them as relative transport. Speaking of traditional vehicles, we can't make a video about Jakarta's public transport without mentioning the Bechak. The Bechak, or cycle rickshaws, are an interesting vehicle. It is a type of tricycle designed to carry passengers on a small scale basis. The driver would pedal the Bechak, moving it along with the passengers. The Bechak were everywhere. There were around 160,000 Bechaks in 1996, 
That's about 15% of Jakarta's workforce at the time. There's even an earthy realm about it. However, in 1971, Betax were banned from major roads, and shortly thereafter, the government attempted a total ban, which reduced their numbers but did not eliminate them. A campaign to eliminate them succeeded in 1990 and 1981, but during the economic crisis of 1988, some returned amid less effective government attempts to control them. Betax were banned because they caused crash degradation and they were seen as exploitation to humans by other humans. In 2018, Governor Anis Baswedan attempted to allow Betrax again due to a political contract he had with Betrax drivers. But it was against a provisional law to do that and most didn't agree with him or cared enough to get it repealed. After the ban in the 70s, the more practical uses for the Betrax were replaced by other vehicles, such as the Bajaj. The Bajaj is essentially a motorized Betrax, hence the English name Auto Rickshaws. The Bajaj here is manufactured by Indian companies Bajaj Auto, hence the Indonesian name, and Teva S. There are two types of Bajaj, the old gasoline orange ones, which are now being phased out, for the blue Bajaj, which use cleaner compressed natural gas. Aside from the Bajaj, there, were also, well, there was also the Bemo, a small truck. The Bemo was Ali Sadikin's choice to replace the Bajaj with, more on Sadikin later. They were donated by the Japanese back to the recession in the 1960s. The Bemo was never meant to be used for human transport. The Japanese thought we were using it for light freight transport. They were mortified to have seats, but they were cramped and uncomfortable. However, later on, Sadikin decided to, get, to start getting rid of it after realizing it was fuel and space inefficient for short travels. Something more space inefficient would later come in the 1970s. The Akot, or share taxi, is public transportation with a predetermined route. Like buses that have bus stops as designated stops, the Akot can stop to pick up or drop off passengers anywhere. The type of vehicle used is a minibus or small bus. The Akot, unlike most transportation we mentioned earlier, has been embraced by Jakarta's authorities. They even made it part of their Dance Jakarta program, which we'll talk about more later. Now, let's talk about Metro Mini. Metro Mini buses were the brainchild of Governor Sumarno, who was to Karno's instructions. At that time, Jakarta didn't have any mass transport after the trams were removed, so there was demand for cheap public transportation. At first, there was no management to manage the buses. Later, Governor Heng Ngan Tung gave the buses to private companies, but it wasn't handled well. In 1976, Pete Metro Mini was established in conjunction with the Jakarta Transport Cooperative, or Kopaja, to support people operating buses on the instructions of Governor Arendli Sadikin. Metro Minis no longer exist today. The government of Jakarta replaced them with Metro Trans, Basically, transfer card is alternative to Metro Minis. One last type of traditional transportation, the Ojek. After the more strict ban on the Betrak in the early 1990s, Ojek services began as grassroots entrepreneurs saw an opportunity to provide transportation options for people who used to use Betrak from main roads into housing complexes. Although Ojek is not an official form of public transport, it can be found throughout Indonesia and Jakarta. They are especially useful when navigating crowded urban roads, narrow alleyways, heavy traffic, and cramped locations that larger vehicles cannot reach. Ojeks nowadays are mostly controlled by private companies like Gojek and Grab. Known as Ojek Online locally, its popularity skyrocket for its transport and delivery services, as well as, as its ease of use. Of course, there are still independent Ojeks in several corners around Jakarta, and especially in the rural areas. While well, there is more traditional transport I could talk about, such as the Kobaja, Halichak, Oplet, Kanchil, River Taxi, and more, due to time limitations, I decided to leave these out. With all of the pre 2000s transportation I bought to mention out of the way, let's talk about today. Today, Jakarta is a much different place than before. Its, pop its population skyrocketed and, ne and needs public transportation more than ever. That's why several governors have approved public transport schemes in, in hopes of cutting down traffic jams and pollution in the air by decreasing the number of cars in the road. Alright, now let's talk about Ali Sadikin. Sadikin helped develop Jakarta into a modern mega metropolis. And while a lot of Jakartans remember him fondly, sadly, his policies caused something that, with many consequences right now. 
His policies are one of the reasons why most alternative or traditional transport are undermined in favor of car or more modern public transport. Which is while well, is up to debate, it is, in my opinion, a bit sad because researching this topic made me appreciate people who are keeping these methods of transport alive. Later governors would build superhighways crisscrossing the capital, mostly ignoring public transport. These governors' car subject policies would cause Jakarta to get slowly but surely more traffic jammed every year because people were buying more and more cars. There was, however, one glimmer of hope, hope in 1972. Before the construction of the superhighways began, the PNK, National Train Company, ordered, ordered ten new sets of electric multiple, multiple units from Japan, leading to the revival of electric train services between Greater Jakarta. The trains would later be managed under the KAI commuter line Jabodetabek or KCJ company in 2008. They're fast, faster than riding cars due to Jakarta's hefty congestion. They are notoriously described as inconvenient by commuters, but they were public transport that people used and still use. Currently, there are about 80 stations in Greater Jakarta. However, these weren't perfect. Building them took lots of time. They simply weren't practical for shorter distances. That's why another modern public transport, a bus rapid transit serving Jakarta Jakarta, was built. Trans Jakarta! The idea of building a bus rapid transit in Jakarta has been around since 2001. Later, Governor Sutioso fell up on the idea. After careful planning and multiple concepts by different private, foreign, and public institutions, Transjakarta started operating on the 15th of January 2004. The first inaugurated corridor was Corridor 1, the, which went from Block M to Stasiun Kota, stopping by 18 stations. With the aim of providing a faster, more comfortable, and affordable transportation service for Jakartans, since the beginning of Transjakarta's operation, ticket prices have been set to be subsidized by the local government. The cost of a ticket is 3,500 IDR, about a quarter of USD. Their main attraction, the buses themselves, stops at 243 stations and goes through 13 corridors, with 100 plus bus routes serving as the feeder routes. Aside from their main buses, Transjakarta also has Metrotrans, the replacement for the Metro Mini and Microtrans, an uncut network operated by Transjakarta, both of which I mentioned earlier. Since Transjakarta uses e-ticketing, employing prepaid cards provided by banks is far more convenient than you can run change everywhere. It's very easy to get around Jakarta with them. These e-cards can also be used in the KRL and MRT LRT systems, which I'll discuss now. After long planning, and years of delay, the Jakarta MRT is in service. The Jakarta city government decided on a rail-based system because of its ability to quickly and cheaply carry large numbers of, numbers of people. The MRT is your typical metro system capable of carrying many passengers, perfect for accommodating the colossal amount of Jakarta's commuting. The LRT is a light metro system. Like the MRT, it carries fewer people, but it is easier to build and cheaper to maintain. And finally, the provincial government has opened new segregated bike lanes. I'm on one of them, here at Sudirman Road. These bike lanes are still de developed right now. It's not perfect, but it is progress, and it's returning Jakarta to its Dutch roots. However, that was the present. What is the future of public transportation in Jakarta? In, in the MRT and LRT are still being expanded every day, with the LRT getting a Greater Jakarta line, which is in development right now. The buses are also getting electrified by 2030. The car-centric policies are slowly being dismantled to be more human-centric, thanks in part to the folks at, at Transport Jakarta. We're still in the crosshairs on this. We're building MRTs, buses, and other, other public infrastructure, but we're still building highways and doing car-centric planning. Hopefully, the government will push in the former direction as we desperately need, need to dismantle Jakarta's negative perception of gridlocking and pollution. And that's all I could cover in a short video. You can and should check the sources down below for further information. And also, check out Transport for Jakarta, which is helping to improve our mega metropolis. Thank you for watching.